Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Let's look at LP2. Yeah, this it's, is to Tom Adams. Who's Tom Adams? He's an old friend I met in the Army. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go ahead and read. The shit is about to hit the fan in West Virginia. Go ahead. Why don't you read it? Because you wrote it. Sure. The, the shit is about to hit the fan in West Virginia, WV. The lawyer for the farmer finally realizes the surfactant issue. He is threatening to go to the press to embarrass us to pressure for big bucks. Want me to read the bad, read the bad word Yeah, there? it says fuck him. That's what it says. I apologize to anybody that's sensitive about bad words. Well, you wrote it. I was writing to an old army friend. So. Right. In 1999, a West Virginian cattle farmer named Wilbur Tennant and his lawyer, Rob Ballot, brought a federal suit against DuPont for contaminating Wilbur's pasture and killing his cows with the chemical waste they were dumping into a creek shared by both DuPont and Tennant. Following the filing, DuPont and the EPA agreed to commission a study of the DuPont property that was adjacent to Tennant's and would include three veterinarians chosen by DuPont and three by the EPA. What this initial study found was that DuPont was not responsible for the ailing cattle and other wildlife found sick and dead near the pasture, but rather it was, quote, poor nutrition, inadequate veterinary care, and lack of fly control, unquote, on the part of Wilbur and Sandy Tennant. So, but this is, this conclusion was brought by both parties, both DuPont and the independent party, or just DuPont's? DuPont and the EPA, which, as we will see later, I would not call an independent, independent party. Independent party, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate because it seemed pretty, pretty cut and dry that it was. Yeah. I would say that it, it still is pretty cut and dry that it was. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how did they, yeah. So yeah. that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, and what was more unfortunate was the reaction of the other people in Parkersburg once the word had gotten out that the tenants were taking on DuPont. Longtime friends refused to speak with them anymore. People would walk out of restaurants when they entered and when they like were actually approached when these people were approached and asked what is wrong with you the tenants got the response i'm not allowed to talk to you and it's not that dupont was like gag order on everybody in parkersburg but like the tenants were taking on the largest employer in that's what i was just gonna say they're taking on the source of income so people yeah. are obviously going to favor keeping a job and yeah 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 and I mean, it got so bad, they actually had to change churches four different times because of the Ugh. hostility. And Parkersburg is, like, not a huge town. Right. But so they doing... got shunned by the by the whole community, by essentially. the whole community, yeah. Wow. And, I mean, we'll, we'll see later that there are stories of people who were, like, on their side. But it's still, like, you can't separate DuPont from Parkersburg whatsoever. But the lawyer, Balot, he was doing what he could to build a case, but nothing in the documentation he'd received from DuPont pointed to anything other than poor husbandry. Like, obviously, that's what their reports are going to, you know, say. Mm, obviously, yeah. So he started pulling permits and land deeds. He was looking for anything he could find related to the plot of land DuPont had purchased from the tenants in 1984, which was now referred to as the Dry Run Landfill. Then, he and his own chemical expert found references to PFOA, which the expert knew was related to PFOS, and they took that little bit of information and started searching through all the records that they had, again, looking for PFOA references. Okay. And PFOA, just as a reminder, is the C8 compound produced by 3M and then used by DuPont for the manufacture of Teflon. Right, 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 right. So, still... They had nothing. Like, even going through all these documents again, they still had nothing. And so Balot requested more information from DuPont, and the company refused. No surprises there. Right. And then in 2000, Balot had a court force DuPont to give him the information and dozens of boxes containing approximately 110 
thousand internal documents and confidential studies were delivered to his law office. And many of them, I'm sure, are the documents that have since been made very public that I was able to use to research this series. So he was going to start seeing all of this very direct damning stuff. That, mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to be a chemical expert to be like, this is fucked up. Right. So he learned about the improper dumping. He learned about the leaching into the groundwater, the increased liver sizes of animals exposed to PFOA, the elevated levels of PFOA found in factory workers' blood, the birth defects, the spread of dust from factory chimneys that ended up in the water supply of local towns, everything I mentioned in the last episode, spanning four decades now. But he also was given more recent documents that were authored after the purchase of the dry run landfill in 1984. Fantastic. (laughs) So, in 1989, there was an unusually high number of leukemia deaths among employees at the West Virginia plant, as well as an unusually high occurrence of kidney cancers in male workers, and these illnesses were not isolated among workers who had worked directly with C8 anymore. As the 90s progressed, scientists at DuPont discovered that PFOA was linked to testicular, pancreatic, and liver tumors in test animals, and some of their own employees were coming forward with signs of prostate cancer. In 1991, DuPont chemists established an internal safety limit for PFOA contamination in drinking water of one part per billion, and wrote that a level measured above that would pose a, quote, risk that needs to be disclosed to the community, unquote, if it were to be found in, like, rivers and drinking water Mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. And yet, later that year, they found a local water district with PFOA levels near three parts per billion and decided not to inform the public. Mm, unacceptable. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're three times the, the risky amount. Right, like, yeah. And not surprised, but also... <laughs> disappointed. Un- dis- yeah, not surprised, but very disappointed. So a draft press release written that same year, 1991, declared, quote, DuPont and 3M studies show that C8 has no known toxic or ill effects in humans at the concentrations detected. As for most chemicals, exposure limits for C8 have been established with sufficient safety factors to ensure there is no health concern. This only ever remained a draft, however. In case someone did hear something and DuPont needed to do damage control, they had tons of documents like these. They had so many, like... Scientists. Ready to go. Yeah, PR people and, like, external consulting firms working behind the scenes just in case. Like, I think they knew the shit was going to hit the fan by the 90s. At some point. Like, they knew it was going to happen at some point, just not an if, but when. Right. As Bruce Carr, DuPont's corporate medical director, put it in a 1991 correspondence regarding a $45,000 study into elevated liver enzymes among their employees, do the study... After we are sued. Wow. Mm -hmm. And Carr did deny this was his written comment in 2004, but... Well, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. It doesn't doesn't sound very good when you put it that way. (laughs) Right. And again, it's like super damning and you don't want to be the person on the other side of that. Right. In 1993, an alternative chemical was found that internal chemists considered the first viable candidate to replace PFOA in their processes. It was less toxic and remained in the body for a shorter length of time, but ultimately DuPont decided against switching because it could affect products that had been made a certain way for decades, and they couldn't allow for any deviation from customer expectations of those products. Like, (laughs) Um, okay, like, yeah, um, safety and less toxic, but our Teflon pans won't be the same. Right. I mean, it just reminds me of people who, like, complain that bug spray doesn't have DDT in it anymore. Right. It's like, uh, you know that Do you people. like living? <laughs> yeah, you like living, right? When it came to tenants' land and the impacts PFOA had, had had on their pasture, Balot found evidence in the documents that DuPont had disposed of 7,100 tons of PFOA sludge into the dry run landfill by 1990, within just six years. And they knew that the Dry Run Creek ca- contained astronomical levels of PFOA. So Balot had caught them in their lie. He had caught them with their own documentation. Mm-hmm. There was no way that they could blame poor animal husbandry on the death of tenants' animals, and DuPont and the EPA both knew it. In fact, 
While scientists at DuPont had been measuring their impact on the environment since they first began dumping PFAS-laden sludge into landfills and rivers and keeping tabs on the serum level of their own employees, they had knowingly been allowing cattle to drink from streams that had C8 levels that were 100 times greater than their internal safety limit for water, and they didn't tell the cattle owners or anyone else about it. Jesus. Yeah. So, the lot called the lawyer for DuPont, and after a short conversation, the company chose to settle with the tenants for an undisclosed sum. He may have gotten his client the money he, he'd wanted to help recuperate for some of his losses, but Balot was not done with DuPont. He wrote up a 972-page public brief against the company with 136 exhibits. Oh, he went he went ham. <laughs> he did. He, he did. He, he really saw this and was like, I'm fucking coming for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In it, he wrote, we have confirmed that the landfills and pollutants released into the environment by DuPont and its dry run landfill and other nearby DuPont owned facilities may pose an imminent and substantial threat to health or the environment. Short, simple, to the point. Right. And then 900 pages to support. 900 pages <laughs> later, he says, like, why this is a problem. Right. With 136 exhibits <laughs> saying, you fucked up, you poisoned everybody. Right. <laughs> So he sent out this letter on March 6, 2001, and among the recipients were the then-current administrator of the EPA and the U.S. Attorney General. DuPont responded by demanding a gag order on the lot to prevent mm. him from presenting to the government the documents that they had turned over to him for the tenant case. Which was a bad move on their part because the gag order was denied and then Balot sent the whole 110,000 <laughs> 110, page set of files to the epa <laughs> yeah that like yeah they fucked up <laughs> they fucked up they fucked up like <laughs> well and when you say it's kind of like pleading the fifth right mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. when you say hey do not let this man talk there might be sense coming from his mouth right <laughs> like yeah otherwise why would you why would you be fighting it so hard <laughs> exactly exactly the EPA would spend the next four years sifting through the evidence provided to them by Balot and conducting their own investigation into the matter. And in the meantime, Balot decided to come at DuPont from a different direction by filing a class action lawsuit against the company on behalf of 80,000 people who worked or lived in the six public water systems near the Parkersburg plant. This included Sue and Bucky Bailey, as well as Ken Wamsley, Jeremy Darling, and Joe and Darling Kiger, just to name a few people. As we mentioned in the last episode, Bucky was a baby born to Sue Bailey in 1981. Sue worked at DuPont in the Teflon department and, and had not been warned that the company had found links between Teflon exposure and birth defects, even after Bucky was born with several facial defects that required extensive surgery. She and the rest of the women in the Teflon department were quietly moved to other assignments and blamed for their children's misfortune. Bucky Bailey married his wife Melinda in 2003. Like many couples, they wanted to have children together, but they were naturally worried about what the implication of CA in Bucky's system might be. Mm. He underwent genetic testing and found that over 20 years after his exposure to CA in utero, the levels of CA in his blood were still astronomical, higher what? even than those of his mother, who was the one originally exposed. And this is no doubt because of the biopersistence of CA. Wow, that's that's insane. Yeah, it was it was heartbreaking. I, I was watching this in the Devil We Know documentary that was made about Balot and his class action lawsuit. And I mean, Bucky, for the most part, has come out like pretty okay and lived a pretty normal life. But watching him and his wife, like... Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. Ken Wamsley worked in the Teflon division at the same time as Sue. But along with all the other men, was assured that the only potential issue was to fetuses which had been discovered in a 3M study but was not talked openly about to avoid the company taking responsibility. The women were only being moved because their babies or future babies would be impacted, but the men would be fine. In 2002, Wamsley had to be treated for rectal cancer by having his rectum and part of his colon surgically removed. And even then, he was only expected to live another two months. Mm. He 
in 2019, he actually was still alive, so he was doing oh, wow. pretty well considering. Okay. He believes his illness is directly related to constant exposure to C8 powder that was not kept under a hood while he worked with it as an analyst because he believed it, as did everybody else, believe it to be harmless. Right. Like, I mean, they were led to believe that it was safe. So why would they take these pre like precautions like working with it under a hood if it's believed to be safe? Right. Yeah. Like that's not like I don't I don't want to say like he's at fault here at all for doing this. No. Like, no, it would be his superiors to tell him like, hey, this is, you know, you this is dangerous. This. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Jeremy Darling was only 26 back in 1998 when he was first diagnosed with testicular cancer. He had to have a surgery to remove one of his testicles and another to re remove a lymph node from his abdomen. But unlike Wamsley and Bailey, the reason for his sickness was less apparent, and he thought he was just one of those unlucky people who got cancer young. Darling had never worked for DuPont or 3M or any chemical company. He had, however, grown up in Belpre, Ohio, just downstream on the Ohio River from the Parkersburg plant and its smokestacks full of C8 fumes. Mm. So he had no idea, really. No, no. He like, was just... He had no inclination. He just thought he was unlucky. Wow. Yeah. Joe Kiger was Balot's lead plaintiff in the class action lawsuit. In October of 2000, when DuPont was scrambling and the rest of the world was beginning to understand the implications of fluorocarbons, even if they didn't grasp the gravity yet, Kiger received a letter from the Lubeck Public Service District, which was the company that provided drinking water to him and his neighbors in Parkersburg. They were writing to inform their customers that PFOA had been detected in their drinking water, but that there was not necessarily a health risk involved with said detection. Mm -hmm. Okay. A few weeks later, a friend of his from the area was diagnosed with cancer, and his wife recalled her ex-husband, who had been a chemist at DuPont's PFOA lab, and had often come home from work horribly ill, to the point where he had a fever and was vomiting, and he called it the Teflon flu. Darlene herself had to have an emergency hysterectomy at 36, and they weren't the only local people they could think of who had been affected with mysterious illnesses. They knew of young men with testicular cancer, neighbors whose dogs were covered with tumors, and friends whose kids were sick, their teeth were turning black with no explanation. Wow. So, Joe Kiger contacted both the Water District and the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection for more information on PFOA, but he wasn't told anything. In fact, he was actually constantly hung up on or dismissed, or he thinks he was lied to at one point, like just flat out lied to. I mean, somebody had to know. Somebody did know, yeah. He kept calling around and visiting in person, and eventually he got in contact with somebody at the EPA who directed him to Balot. And it was okay. just it was just in time, really, because according to West Virginia statute of limitations, there's only a two year window for pursuing legal action after being informed of a contamination. Mm. And with all of the running around that he'd been doing right. in the back and forth, that was almost up. What Balot found was that the detection of PFOA, which he knew could obviously lead to health implications in direct contradiction of that letter, that contamination was above DuPont's threshold for drinking water safety. So it was above that one part per billion. Mm -hmm. He also learned that the Lubeck Public Service District, which served drinking water to 4,000 people, had allowed its letter to be reviewed by DuPont's public affairs manager before being released. <sighs> Well, mm. that's not exactly unbiased. No, <laughs> I wouldn't say so. And if you want to read this quote from Joe Kiger. Our biggest faith and trust we have is in our utilities. We flip that light switch on. We expect it to come on. We don't think anything about it. You turn your tap to get water. You expect that water to be clean and not have all these chemicals in it. I think now people are starting to find out that someone has lied to them. And I mean, I think that's really the the hardest part is that you do expect these public services to to be safe, to be safe. And none of these people could count on that because DuPont had this company wrapped around their fingers. Mm -hmm. And the law, I think, was, you know, like we said earlier, disappointed, but not surprised to learn right. any of this. The community, which had had levels higher than DuPont's internal guidelines in 1991, was the community served by Lubeck. Well, and also, I'd just like to add that 
we'll get into it later, but maybe that one part per billion, maybe that level's not even safe. You know what I'm saying? Like DuPont's gonna have a much higher, th obviously one, a much higher threshold. So something even lower could be extremely toxic. Totally. Just yeah. a thought. Yeah. Only months after DuPont made the discovery in 1991, they decided to switch to a different external lab to measure C8 levels in water. And this new lab found consistently lower levels of C8 than DuPont's internal chemists had. So they stayed with the outside lab. Mm. But Balot was thinking that the contamination would be limited to the water wells nearest to the Washington Works plant in West Virginia, not all six districts and dozens of private wells in the area, as sure. it turned out. Sure. What Balot also could not have known yet was the opinion of DuPont's own lawyer, whose emails were provided in the, in the discovery of the class action lawsuit and were in part being read at the top of this episode. In 2001, Bernard Riley sent his son a series of emails which were discovered by Balot and read. We learned recently that our analytical technique has very poor recovery, often 25%, so any results we get should be multiplied by a factor of four or even five. However, that has not been the practice, so we've been telling the agency's results that are certainly low. Not a pretty situation, especially since we have been telling the drinking water folks not to worry. Results have been under the level that we deem quote-unquote safe of one part per billion. We now fear we will get data from a better technique that will exceed the number we have touted as safe. Ugh. So far, DuPont has been saying there are safe levels. We need to have an independent agency agree. We are hoping that it will agree to higher levels than we have been saying. If for no other reason than we are exceeding levels we say we set as our own guideline, mostly because no one bothered to do air monitoring until now and our water test has been completely inadequate. Not only do we have people drinking our famous surfactant, but levels in ambient air above our guidelines. Sure, we have our margins of safety in our number, but we should have checked this out years ago and taken steps to remedy. Guess the hills on the other side of the river cause great conditions in ambient levels. The plume hits them before it can disperse more fully. Ugh. I just hate that he kept writing ugh. Like, ugh. I know. <laughs> ugh. Ugh. Like, like that, mean... that adds a, like... <laughs> another level to it that he literally went ugh uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like a fucking kathy comic like come on <laughs> yeah seriously but i mean it's exactly what you were saying that he was like i think the one part per billion might be lowballing it you yeah. Know? yeah yeah prior to filing the class action lawsuit however balat had defined ground to argue that dupont had been poisoning some eighty thousand people with a substance which was not recognized as toxic and DuPont themselves were actually directly responsible for the reason that this was so difficult. And I, my eyes started to go cross when I was trying to research this in particular. Like, there's so much legal, just fuckery. I, I don't have a more <laughs> eloquent way of describing what is wrong with this. So the White House Council on Environmental Quality was established by the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969. One of the first things this council did was try to organize a system that allowed regulators to determine which substances posed environmental and public health risks before they got people sick. So 1969, we're still good and we'll, we're still trying to do good things. And this is like, I think during the Nixon administration. And so it's really weird that like any of this happened. I was like, oh, wow, Nixon did something right. <laughs> right. <laughs> But despite having DuPont's internal documentation, which clearly pointed to human toxicity with chronic exposure at even low levels, you know, in the 2000s, according to the 1976 Toxic Substances Control Act that was made by the Council on Environmental Quality, it said that chemicals can only be tested by the EPA when it has been provided evidence of harm. And that's hard to prove, it's so hard to prove actually, that only five chemicals have been restricted by the EPA in the last 40 years. These are asbestos, polychlorinated biphenyls, dioxin, CFCs, and hexavalent chromium. And does that one sound familiar to you? Yeah, Aaron Brockovich. Aaron Brockovich. And dioxin from the Agent Orange mm -hmm, mm -hmm. episode as well. So given this list, it should be obvious to anybody who's been listening especially that banning a chemical requires a lot of footwork on the part of 
injured people and tough lawyers like well and because we're not test like we're not like hey here's a new chemical let's see it jump through these hoops to make sure it's safe it's let's have this chemical do its nasty dirty work and then try to backtrack and figure out why everybody got sick then make Mm -hmm. these huge lump sum payments when things should things are not necessarily going in the right order right (laughs) right well to prevent all of these tragedies and the issue with these five and then with PFAS is that they were grandfathered in in 1976. Mm. And so anything that was made after 1978 or so, there was about a two year period where they were like, hey, we're going to enforce this. Anything made right. after that, you technically do need to register it as a new chemical and have toxicity unless you can say that it has similar toxicity because of the family of chemicals that it's in to something that was gotcha. grandfathered in, right? Gotcha. That's the issue. But then still, if the toxicity studies are only done in rats or dogs or something, we've said rats and dogs aren't people. And so it has to cause harm in order for us to step in and be like, oh, shit, okay, the EPA is going to do something now. Companies like DuPont are basically allowed to regulate themselves in this regard. They have to do their own toxicity, and then somebody has to complain that the toxicity was worse than we originally thought. And... So that's exactly what DuPont did, was they were like, okay, we're going to regulate ourselves at the critical movement moment when they knew that toxicity was going to be argued by the lot. Now, Mm. previously, as I've been saying, they had internally established a safe drinking water limit of one part per billion. And because these companies were grandfathered in and didn't have to do any toxicology tests, we had to basically rely on, okay, this one part per billion, this is fine. Is this, this is the number that's good to go. DuPont in particular knew that they essentially had the upper hand in this because an industry trade group called the Manufacturing Chemists Association in the in the 70s, today it's called the American Chemistry Council, they were the reason that the Toxic Substances Control Act is fucked up in the way that it is and it doesn't prevent harm like the council wanted to in mm. 1969. They blocked any attempts to regulate industry. And one of the core members of this group was DuPont. They were a core (laughs) member of the Manufacturing (laughs) Chemists Association. But it gets worse than that. It's not just that they were a core member. Another name for the TSCA is the Heckert Eckhart Bill, referring to the collaboration on the bill made by environmentalist Bob Eckhart and DuPont Vice President slash Chair of the Manufacturing Chemists Association, <laughs> Richard Hecker. They knew, like, they, they knew intimately they how bad it was. Yeah, and they were the reason it was so bad. Wow. See, things like this should not, <laughs> should not be okay. <laughs> and, like, we've, we've talked on the show about the FDA, like, does a kind of mediocre job at keeping right. us safe. But I didn't know so much about the EPA. And so, like, I don't know. I didn't know. And then I read it and I was like, oh, I should have known that. I should have known. (laughs) I should have known the whole time. But, like, how can you know? How, like, I guess, I don't know. Just just based on what we know and what we've lived, you could have guessed, like, okay, yeah, of course the industry is going to regulate it. But it was just so, like, disheartening to be like, oh, that's how it works? Fucking really? Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate to find this out so dupont knows that they can regulate themselves and the bill is written for them by them and so what they did right before balat was able to make his move was that they announced a new safety level for pfoa in drinking water okay and this level was 150 parts per billion (laughs) yeah Yeah, their own lawyers emailing his son, like, one part per billion might be a little high. And they're like, 150, 150 parts, per parts per billion. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> fuck numbers. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Meanwhile, Balat was trying to work on his own toxicity to, you know, prove harm and all of that. And so his scientists that were working with him found that what they thought was safe was 0.2 parts per billion. However... The 150 part per billion number had been established by not only DuPont internal scientists, but of course, somebody else wrapped around their fingers, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. 
And so they decided to stick with it. They decided to say 150 parts per billion. That sounds reasonable to us. And another terrible twist of legal fuckery. The three lawyers that DuPont most depended on to defend them against the law were hired by the Department of Environmental Protection within two years of this reassessment of the threshold for drinking water. (sighs) Making it so that the lawyers who established this safety limit became the government regulators who were going to enforce it. Wow, that is some next level fuckery. I know, I know. I wish I could be more eloquent, but my brain just gets set on fire. (laughs) No, that's some next level shit right there. Wow. Yeah. And we focused a lot on 3M last episode. I haven't forgotten about them. 3M's information shared with DuPont had also not been spared in Balot's investigation. And they could see that the shit was about to seriously hit the fan, possibly because they were also being pressured by the EPA to cease production of PFOA. In May of 2000, 3M decided to stop making C8 and Scotchgard noting in an article with the New York Times that the products were, quote, not environmentally friendly, which is like the fucking understatement of the century. I was just going to say, (laughs) not environmentally friendly doesn't wrap into kills humans, gives them cancer, gives their children fucking birth defects. Like, that is the most sugar-coated way of putting (laughs) it that that they could have gone. Like, you could also say, like, it's not... Not great. What's <laughs> happening? What's with what's going on here with this okay. chemical? It, it's not. It's not fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's not less than we'd like. Yeah. It, <sighs> oh my god. Okay. Yeah. And they also said that these chemicals were present in human blood, but at low levels, which are not harmful. And it's a load of shit too. We know that. Yeah. But DuPont decided to make their own C8 at a new facility in Fayetteville. If 3M wasn't going to do it, they were going to do do it. Do it themselves. DuPont released a statement to the residents near the new plant saying that, quote, DuPont has used C8 for more than 50 years with no observed health effects in workers, unquote. Curiously, no one mentions the resignation letter of 3M toxicologist and whistleblower Richard Purdy, which he sent to both 3M and the EPA in 1999, and said that, quote, the chemical is more stable than many rocks, and the chemicals the company is considering for replacement are just as stable and biologically available. So what does he, he mean by that? By biologically available? Yes. They are just as biopersistent. And they have the same, probably, I'm assuming, tendency to biomagnify. Because we haven't seen the biomagnification yet, but we will. And I think he was probably already aware of that. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, I don't know, just the EPA being like, oh, no, we didn't know. And now we're coming after you because we know now because of a lot. Like, no. They got this resignation letter in 1999 where he was trying to say, I can't work for this company anymore. Right. Because they're terrible. And the EPA just kind of ignored it. But. Well, yeah, and considering it's they've been working on this for four years and mm-hmm. like they're not taking things ser- as seriously as one would hope. No, no. And like, sure, it's good that like 3M was pressured to stop using C8, but then DuPont's going to make C8 and, you know, start to contaminate in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. But ceasing production, using a new chemical even, it wasn't going to be the end of our problems because we've already established that it was biopersistent. And so even though they were having this come-to-Jesus moment with the EPA over their PFAS chemicals, which they had not declared as new additions to the TSCA inventory because some of them... Because it was related. It was related. I think that some of them they were supposed to submit to the inventory and they didn't. And so the EPA is like, oh, you didn't do the thing. Like, but they knew that they didn't do the thing. Whatever. In an internal document between several of 3M's attorneys... There is clear discussion that they knew that PFOS, which had been declared on the TSCA registry, had a greater substantial risk than originally declared. They knew that their internal studies had, quote, suggested a pattern of exposure and concern for biological magnification to levels that could be toxic. They knew that PFOS was essentially completely absorbed from the digestive tract and is poorly eliminated leading to biomagnification in the food chain and chronic exposure. 
This document, however, was seeking to downplay these dangers to the EPA so that they could continue to use a chemical which they knew to be dangerous to the environments and its inhabitants. So, like, did the EPA know everything? No, but they knew enough. They knew enough that they could have been acting earlier than they would, you know, like you said. Mm Mm-hmm. So, in 2000, they ceased manufacturing of PFOS in the United States and planned a global phase-out by 2002. But the EPA still followed up on their investigation of 3M's PFOS and found 244 separate violations of the TSCA. Oh, my God. Yeah, so... Just by one company. One company. And, like, is it because the EPA wasn't checking in doing their job? Probably. But also 3M was just being shady. So, a little Mm -hmm. little bit of both. 3M chose to pay a $1,521,481 penalty for the TSCA violations in 2006, which were voluntarily disclosed to the EPA in an audit, but which the company denied were violations of the act. Okay, how does that make sense? I don't know. I feel like it's like paying a parking ticket and being like, I wasn't parked illegally. Fuck you. I wasn't (laughs) wrong, but I don't want to have a bench warrant out for my arrest. Yeah, basically. Okay. On top of the fine, they also reformed any processes which they would continue to use for the manufacture of PFAS as they planned to continue using as the EPA was deciding whether C8 should be considered a regulated chemical. But 3M and DuPont, as well as other companies using PFOS like Daikin and Dianon, were part of the Fluoropolymer Manufacturers Group, which lobbied the EPA to allow them to provide the science which would describe C8 polluted water, air, soil, food, plants, animals, and humans in exchange for making any agreements regarding C8 voluntary to adhere to. So we'll give you all this information that we already know. We already know that it's toxic. We already you know, don't that know it's that bad. Yet. We'll save you time if you agree that we can voluntarily decide to adhere or not adhere to whatever you decide to say about C8. Yeah, that's so fucking sketchy. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god. It just gets it gets worse. It, it's and gets, yeah. Worse. This is, yeah. <laughs> like, just when you think it didn't get bad enough. <laughs> and so 3M is really the focus of the EPA. And DuPont was not being dogged by the EPA because they were working with the EPA to have them issue statements that the chemicals produced by DuPont posed no threat, carcinogenic or otherwise, to humans. The former deputy administrator of the EPA, Mike McCabe, began working as a private consultant for DuPont in 2003. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) They also had other private consultant agencies to help them build their defense, as I said before, but this is where they're being sourced from. Right. In 2003, the Weinberg Group's vice president wrote the following in a memo. The constant theme which permeates our recommendations on the issues faced by DuPont is that DuPont must shape the debate at all levels. We must implement a strategy at the outset which discourages governmental agencies, the plaintiff's bar, the misguided environmental groups from pursuing this matter any further than the current risk assessment contemplated by the Environmental Protection Agency and the matter pending in West Virginia. We strive to end this now. This vice president also assured DuPont that they would help them through the current PR crisis in West Virginia as they had helped their other clients. Beginning with Agent Orange in 1983, we have successfully guided clients through a myriad of regulatory litigation and public relations challenges. Wow. <laughs> to call the to Agent, call Agent Orange, Orange a client. And to say it was a challenge. Like, it was a challenge. <laughs> yeah, so wow. This, this is the kind of people we're dealing with. The kind of people who decide, I would make more with DuPont than in government. Right. And I'm going to work with them. And I have previous experience working through the Agent Orange crisis. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Following DuPont's change in their safety threshold to 150 parts per billion that they threw out and the blot was like, okay, gotta fucking work around this. Mm -hmm. He decided to find a different way to come after them for poisoning the water in Parkersburg. Although West Virginia had some fucked up legal loopholes that allowed people with obvious conflicts of interest to establish and enforce drinking water safety levels for chemicals... 
they were also one of the first states to recognize tort laws, which are essentially medical monitoring legal claims. Okay. In, in torts, all a plaintiff has to do to win their case is prove that they have been exposed to a toxin, and then the defendant has to fund regular medical tests. If the tests find anything that requires further medical attention, or if the plaintiff becomes ill later in life, they can retroactively sue for those medical damages. Okay. Sounds okay. pretty good. That, so that all sounds good. That all sounds good. Balot used this strategy to take his class action lawsuit to a state court in West Virginia, even though four of the six water districts he was representing were actually in Ohio. This became known as the Leach case, which was depicted in the 2019 movie Dark Waters, which I haven't seen but was constantly referenced as I was researching. In September of 2004, DuPont agreed to settle the class action lawsuit with Balot and the 80,000 people he represented agreeing to pay up to $343 million, wow. which included $85 million paid directly to the plaintiffs, $22.6 million in attorney's fees, and funding for installation of filtration plants in the affected water districts, as well as for a scientific study to determine if there was a probable link between PFOA and any diseases. Under the tort law, if there was any link found, DuPont would have to pay for the medical monitoring for the 80,000 plaintiffs for the rest of their lives. Wow. However, everyone represented in the lawsuit was prohibited from filing personal injury lawsuits against DuPont for their medical expenses until the study had concluded. So could they just try to prolong this study like as long as possible like is that something so that even they... though they were funding the study they actually did seem to get legitimate scientists on board okay. for it and there wasn't a whole lot of dupont fingers in the pie of the study okay okay so the study to establish or refute a connection was conducted by a local research team actually and so this these were the people who decided to initially gather the blood samples that they needed and they offered $400 to each participant who had been living in one of the six affected water districts for a year or more and was willing to voluntarily donate for testing. In this way, they got samples for 69,000 people, which is a very nice population size uh, for a study. Yeah. it's. I think it's the largest single health study that's ever been conducted because there's that nurses study that's conducted on all the nurses right and i think this is bigger so it's like okay. the biggest largest public health study that's ever been conducted wow and a group called the c8 science panel was formed to test the samples and pair them with questionnaires you know mm -hmm. do you smoke where do you live all that and eventually their findings were published in peer-reviewed journals so all of this is very above board okay but the, they had to wait. So while the plaintiffs waited, the EPA was still investigating DuPont based on documents made available to them in discovery. And although they had been made aware of 3M's rat study in 1980, which showed a link between C8 and birth defects, the EPA had not been informed that any of DuPont's workers had tested positive for C8 in their blood and had given birth to children with birth defects, which means that the EPA did not know that it could pass through the placenta. Mm. For withholding this information and violating the TSCA, DuPont was fined $16.5 million, but not required to admit liability and actually claimed that the EPA had already known that C8 was teratogenic based on the rat studies and that the human birth defects were, quote, merely confirmatory. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To talk about human life, life as being is merely confirmatory, confirmatory of a fucking report. That's gross. And of course, I think everyone is wrong. Like, yeah, the EPA knew, but also DuPont was wrong. The EPA is wrapped around their finger. Everybody's trying to cover their own ass at this point. Right. But at this time, $16.5 million was the largest civil administrative penalty the EPA had ever taken from a company, and it was still less than 2% of the PFOA profits DuPont earned alone that year. Wow. That's yeah. insane. They're a gigantic company. Yeah. So, back to that huge human health study. It took seven years, and it took $33 million. 
But in December of 2011, the C8 Science Panel found that a probable link did exist between PFOS exposure and a number of diseases, including kidney cancer, testicular cancer, preeclampsia and pregnancy-induced hypertension, thyroid disease, ulcerative colitis, and high cholesterol. Following these findings, anyone living in the Ohio River Valley could pursue claims against DuPont for personal injury and wrongful death, including but not limited to any claims for injective relief and special, general and putative, and any other damages whatsoever associated with such claims related to exposure of C8. Unfortunately, Wilbur and Sandy Tennant were not counted among those who would be able to have their medical bills taken care of by the company which sickened them. Wilbur Tennant died of a heart attack in 2009 at the age of 67, but was already sick with cancer. Two years later, his wife Sandy died from cancer. Well, that's fucking tragic. I know. 3,500 defendants filed multi-district litigations to sue DuPont for their illnesses. Carla Bartlett was the first to take them to court in September of 2015. Bartlett lived and drank water in Coolville, Ohio from 1983 until she was diagnosed with kidney cancer in 1997. She was awarded $1.1 million for negligence and $500,000 for emotional distress. Meanwhile, the communities impacted by 3M are doing what they can to get that company held accountable, but no one is making it easy. Because are they, they're a bigger company than DuPont, right? They're a similarly large company, I think. They might be okay. slightly smaller. Okay. In 2005, Oakdale, Minnesota became the second U.S. city to report mass contamination of PFOA when it was detected in five of the city's water wells. However, when state officials made this announcement, the mayor at the time, Carmen Sarak, did the publicity stunt I abhor politicians doing the most and said that the amounts in the water were negligible and then took a drink of ostensibly contaminated uh. tap water to prove it because he's an idiot politician who wants to conflate chronic and acute exposure just like everybody who pulls this stunt right although i think there was somebody who did this a politician who did this with water that had lead in it and it ended up being an acute exposure oh nice <laughs> and they had to take a vacation for a while oh, after wow. that wow <laughs> yeah. yeah good so at the time of this little circus act minnesota's recommended threshold for pfos in drinking water was one part per billion but for pfoa it was seven parts per billion which was seven times higher than dupont's internal threshold which we've already established mm -hmm. was high itself one of the main scientists whose job it was to research the presence of PFAS for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was named Fardin Ollier, and she voiced her concerns that the PFAS were coming from the 3M plant. Besides water, she was also sampling fish in the areas and found a white bass in 2005 with 29,600 parts per billion of PFOS in it. She was so shocked by the number she tested it twice. Well, yeah, I would say so, because that's even worse than, like, even if we take the 150 number. I know. That's still blowing it out of the fucking water. Yeah, and I think Holy this has shit. to do with that biomagnification. Like, the fish is living in the water that's contaminated, but if it's eating plants or other fish that are right. contaminated, you get that biomagnification. Wow. So, soon after finding this, she started pointing fingers at 3M. And then after that, sampling of fish became banned by the state. <gasps> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can't find it if you can't test for it. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the woman who hired Olier, her name was Cheryl Corrigan, and she seemed to change her opinion on the role of scientists at the MPCA because she said, quote, I'm not sure that research scientists belong at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, what? Who in who said? Who the fuck says that scientists don't belong in a research agency? You're, oh my god! She, okay. She also said that there might be PFOS in the water, but it was up to the EPA to research those dangers and to make determinations on regulation, not the MPCA. So she's like, I don't, this isn't even our job. I know I was specifically hired to look at this, but this isn't our job. Wow. Yeah. So 
Olier saw that shit was fucked up, and she filed a whistleblower lawsuit against Corrigan, but she was eventually forced out of the MPCA in 2006. And then, that same year that she was kicked out, more wells were found to be contaminated, putting an estimated 67,000 people at risk of exposure in Minnesota. This is a different state. Right. But Oakdale's exposure was the worst. Now, 3M did pay $10 million for a new water treatment system in Oakdale that year and for a new municipal water service in two neighborhoods. But it's not nearly enough considering the damage that had already been done. Yeah, you can't undo that. And it just, it gets so much worse than you even know, Venus. <laughs> uh. A 2017 study examining child deaths in Oakdale between 2003 and 2015 found that an Oakdale child was 171% more likely to have cancer than a child who died in the same time period in wow. the surrounding areas. Wow. And I wanted to put more of their stories in here like I did with the the stories for the DuPont lawsuit but it's just it, I it was taking it out of me emotionally to write this episode and Dina yeah. Winter at the Minnesota Reformer she does a great job of profiling these people but there were a lot of teenagers who grew up going to high school with other teenagers who had cancer and it was just kind of a normal thing that's is essentially what they that's said that's tragic like kids had tumors and the ones who have lived to be in their 30s now like they just kind of have to view cancer as a chronic illness that they live with and it's instead of an outlier issue it's a normal yeah. one yeah yeah gotcha. that's yeah that's that's a lot yeah Although 3M continued to deny causality, the rates of cancer in the city decreased following the new filtration system being installed in 2006, which is good that there was there were fewer kids getting cancer in the area in 2006. But it's not but, but we're not eliminating the problem. No, no. We're putting a band-aid on a broken leg. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, Rob Ballot did what he could for the residents of Minnesota and he joined their lawsuit against 3M. But Minnesota's laws are different from West Virginia's. Medical monitoring claims can be pursued in individual suits, but not class action suits in that state. So he would have had to do everything separately, He would have had to do everybody individually. Wow. Which is way more expensive. Right. The state of Minnesota sued DuPont, but the judge, who admitted that her father was a 3M employee for 40 years, did not allow a class action lawsuit to proceed and instead found that the plaintiffs could sue for punitive damages because she found that 3M acted with reckless disregard in their handling of C8. The lawsuit was further narrowed down to encompass only damage to property, and a jury decided in favor of 3M in 2009. Wow. Yeah. In 2010, the Minnesota Attorney General sued 3M for damages to natural resources, as well as for failing to report possible toxicity in humans and animals that could have led to proper regulation. And it is actually the Minnesota Attorney General's website that I've got a lot of the 3M documents from. It was that okay. and the, the Diener Winter Report. So all of that will be referenced in the show notes, or if it's too long for the show notes, we're going to put it up on Patreon and anybody can go see it over there. But... I really recommend that Dean of Winter article. And then Sharon Lerner at The Intercept has also done a lot of really great reporting. And she was interviewed in the documentary that I watched as well. So the Minnesota Attorney General's suit remained against 3M for eight years. And then the morning that the trial proceedings were to begin after eight years, 3M asked to go into negotiations. <laughs> the state negotiated with the company for 22 hours until finally a settlement was reached and 3M agreed to pay $850 million to provide clean drinking water to the people of Minnesota. It was the third largest natural resource settlement in all of U.S. history, only behind the Deepwater Horizon and Exxon Valdez oil spill settlements. Wow. And yet, it was still only just 2.6% of 3M's 2018 revenue. Jesus fucking Christ. And 3M did not admit accountability. So it's a slap on the wrist and they said it's not our fault. Yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's just 
it gets so much worse from here. With <laughs> how? <laughs> okay, I believe you, but how? <laughs> Prior to the start of the Bellwether cases against Dupont, they split off and created a new company, Keymores, in July of 2015. This company took on 37 active plants across the world that still produce Dupont chemicals like Teflon, which were no longer being made with C8 because that was being regulated, but they were now taking on Teflon and all of that. Okay. In doing so, this company also inherited liabilities being filed against 171 sites, including 25 U.S. factories, such as those in the Ohio River Valley, which were being targeted by the leach defendants. It will be Keymore's rather than DuPont, which will shoulder the burden of the $235 million set aside for medical monitoring of the defendants, the $945 million to clean up the 171 sites, and the 32 wrongful death claims from Parkersburg and will be impacted on Wall Street for the outcome of facing these responsibilities. In 2017, DuPont and Keymores agreed to settle the remaining lawsuits from the Leach case by paying out $671 million to the remaining class members. Keymores paid for only half of this, and DuPont paid for the other half. So they're trying to split the burden, essentially. Mm -hmm. This turnout was actually better than expected for those watching on Wall Street, and Keymore's shares actually increased by 13%, while shares for DuPont increased by 1%. Wow. Later that year, DuPont and Dow Chemical Company closed a $130 billion merger. Jesus fucking Christ. So, basically, I'm saying that it gets worse because... Nobody ended up taking responsibility for anything. Right. People are still being injured. And the system isn't broken. It's functioning exactly as it was meant to. Wow. And uh, we haven't even gotten to the part of this story that initially got me interested in doing PFOS for this season. So, so I suppose until next time. Yeah, and then we'll get into what is presently happening because I've only brought us up to 2018. So That's true. We got another five years. Five years. years. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck has happened then? All right. Yeah, but that's a story well, for next time. <laughs> I, 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 I can't say I look forward to it. I look forward to learning. I do not look forward to learning of more tragedy. Yeah, I, I feel like... I was like, I'm going to go, you know, swimming or something. Like, I'm going to go learn about PFAS. And then I was, like, in the ocean having to, like, deal with tidal waves. Like, every time I'm <laughs> yeah, like, I'm, a lot. I'm almost done, I think, getting the notes for this. I'll open up a new tab. And I'm like, oh, God, there's so much more. Yeah, this is a lot bigger than I imagined. Yeah, me too. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us everywhere you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Tumblr, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Bina Stainenko. Stay safe, and remember, the dose makes the poison. <laughs>